Hi, this is Dave Spector in Chicago. Welcome to another episode of Blues from the Inside Out, the podcast that we're not call- that we're now calling Blues from the Inside In. As you know, we're sheltering in place with uh, the pandemic, and I'm very happy to have as my guest this afternoon, this evening, where Kirk is, Kirk Fletcher. Hey, Kirk. Hey, Dave, how you doing? It's good to be here. You know, anything I can do with my Chicago peeps, I'm always yeah. happy, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the last time I, sh- I saw you was just outside of Chicago at Evanston Space. You played a cool show with some of your Chicago buddies. Oh, man, that was so much fun to be there and to play on a Monday night, and people came out to see me, people I had known ever since I was a little baby, actually, friends wow. from my father's church came out to that gig. So it was really special, you know, and yeah. then being close to Chicago is always a standout for me. <laughs> yeah. I, I know you've got a, a lot of your musical roots in Chicago <laughs> as well as personal roots. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe you could share with our, our viewers and listeners, tell us about your father's church and some of your connections to Chicago. Well, you know, we, um, my father, uh, my family's from Pine Bluff, Arkansas, okay. you know, and um, yeah, we just, you know, I just grew up playing in my father's church, you know, and everything. And then along the way, you know, we had a lot of um, cool radio stations. There was this radio station called KLON yeah. 88.1 um, in Long Beach, out of Long Beach, California, and that's where I first really heard, you know, like Howlin' Wolf and Muddy Waters because we had a great DJ at that time called Bernie Pearl. Right. Bernie Pearl's brother ran the Ash Grove, you know, so he's a blues historian, you know. So it was really good to be, you know, eight, nine years old <laughs> and hearing all this music. And I think the music that most captivated me blues-wise, you know, was Chicago blues as well as, you know, Musicians coming from Mississippi, you know. Sure, sure. So, so. Yeah, KL, KLON used to sponsor the Long Beach Blues Festival. I exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And and speaking of, uh, of of locations, you're in Switzerland now, where you live. I'm in, right? I live in Switzerland for the past three years. You know, it's uh, going on with that blues song. Fell in love with the woman and moved to Switzerland. <laughs> Like so many other people, you know, Luther Allison moved to Paris, you know, right? France, you know, and Champion Jack Dupree, I think, too, right? Didn't he move to... Um, yeah, yeah, I think he lived in France. In France and... Memphis so, Slim. Memphis Slim, sure. Uh, yeah. a, lot, a lot of jazz musicians, Dexter Gordon. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so how how you find it over there? You look happy, you sound happy. Well, you know, I mean, I... I I had, you know, the three months or so of like, oh, man, (laughs) you know, and then I just sort of like, you know, really the thing that got me going back, you know, on the right path is really records, you know, listening to just revisiting a lot of records, you know, and I had already started before this all this started. And then posting videos talking about my life, you know, as a musician and guitar things and a lot of Chicago blues, obviously. <laughs> sure. Know? And that was the thing that really kind of started to get me through it. And it seems like people enjoyed what I was doing and what I was talking about. And it was maybe a little bit off the, you know, beaten path for some people. You know, I had never heard of these people like Earl Hooker or, you know, Johnny Young or yeah. People like that, you know, and then maybe, you know, it'll get in this social media world. Maybe their names will kind of Sammy Lahorn and people like that, you know, we can yeah. all try and work together and bring these more obscure guys, you know, a little bit of recognition, which cool. they so, really deserve. Yeah, uh, that's that's important stuff. So you so let yeah. me get this right. You were feeling kind of a disconnect, leaving the States, moving to Switzerland and, and kind of reconnected with music. Well, I, it was you know, more so during this pandemic, you know, oh, the I pandemic see. was the thing that really kind of, you know, made me kind of be down in the dumps a little bit, you know, yeah. we're all human here, you know, sure. like I was getting ready to, I knew I was releasing this new record of mine and everything, yeah. and then it all just kind of stopped like so many of my friends, you know, but that was the thing, you know, I, I realized what I really 
love about music, and I love playing records almost as much as playing music. You know, yeah. I mean, it's a it man. Sometimes I can go for weeks and weeks and weeks by just putting on a pot of coffee, listening to records. So yeah. It's kind of my thing, you know, it's a group of us guys, you know, Rusty's in and guys like that, you know, we all like crate digger kind of guys, I guess. <laughs> got it, got it. Yeah. Uh, speaking of your new record, My Blues Pathway. Yeah, got right. Copy to show us. All right. <laughs> right on. Yeah, and that's coming out. It's coming out later this month. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. September 25th. Wow. It's September already. Wow. Yeah, it is. Well, congrats. Um. Where Thank can you. people check it out, buy it, and hear it? Well, it's on a Cleopatra Records out of L.A., and it's going to be everywhere. You know, have some vinyl, Amazon, my website, Cleopatra website, um, okay. you know, all the streaming and all that stuff. And maybe if you can even make it out to a record store, it'll be there, too. Cool. Okay. Tell, tell me about <laughs> Cleopatra Records. I'm not hip. Yeah, this is a, a record label that kind of has, like, a lot of different – you know, different offshoots of the label. And I think Joe Lewis Walker's latest record is on there too. Okay. And they have this Cleopatra Blues and I think Kenny Neal recorded for them, Eric Gales and different people. And yeah, it's just, you know, I was just, I, I done my um, previous record, Hold On. I done that myself, you know, so I just decided to get a little help on this one and still try and, you know, just... Yeah make it happen, you know, and it seemed to be pretty, a pretty easy fit, you know, cause you know how it is, you know, it just seemed like it was no real problems or anything like that. So it was just easy, you know? Yeah. The record business can be a rough road for a lot of people. So that's good to hear. Yeah. You know, it just was pretty straightforward, you know, cause I, I really need straightforward in my life because being a musician <laughs> is complicated most yes. of the time. I hear you. <laughs> And that 90 have, minute set, <laughs> you know, that's when you get to do your thing, but everything else is challenging sometimes. Sure. And uh, there are a couple a couple new singles from the record that are already out. In fact, yeah. I just watched the, the video for uh, Ain't No Cure for the Dop. Is it, is it, I'm, correct me on the, the, is Ain't it? Ain't No Cure for the Downhearted. Yeah. yeah. That that kind of rolls off the tongue. Ain't no cure for the Don Hart. It sounds like a blues song to me. Well, <laughs> that's, that's one of my most favorite things to do is to find these old blues songs and find like different little things out of them. You know, like Sonny Boy Williamson has a bunch of songs with different things. I even cover Fattening Frogs for Snakes on the um, on okay. my new record. You know, it's yeah. just even my writing. I try and incorporate some of this you know or some of like the language that my mom and dad would say that country kind of southern lingo you know i love marrying that with modern things you know yeah and i saw the video and it was really powerful and um you know it seems to carry a, a message of uh social justice and and kind of yeah. some you know maybe uh deals with not maybe but deals with some of the the turmoil you know that's been happening in the states uh, yeah. can, can you talk about that and maybe the message that the song uh conveys yeah well you know that song is really about you know i i even say in there you know like without getting too political you know i say things like you know in a crowded room i'm sometimes all alone could it be by my own choice or selfish greed you know and i mean that's pretty you know, tongue in cheek, I mean, and then I have things where I say like, you know, um, a great man once said he had a dream, talking about Martin Luther King. Do we still dream? Do we still think about things like we used to? I remember being a kid, you know, dreaming of one day playing with Albert King or something, or, you know, all of these dreams that you have when you're a kid. And nowadays, you know, kids are so consumed with everything. You know, I have a 23-year-old daughter, and I mean, it's like her hand is like a phone, you know, mounted in her hand, <laughs> you know, and just all of these things. And also, like, the, you know, the guy or woman looking back over their life and the regrets and the things, you know, and, and looking at other people, you know, and saying, well, they have this and they have that. 
but I don't have it, you know, and they just are so depressed. And it's yeah. like no cure, you know, it's just like they just want to be dark about it. You know, you can either be glass half empty or half full, you know. Sure. Well, that's, that's the gist of it, you know. Right. Right. Yeah. Interesting. And uh, the single that dropped earlier, uh, No Place to Go. Yeah. Yeah. I, I saw that you wrote that with Richard Cousins. Oh, Richard Cousins, my neighbor here in Switzerland. <laughs> oh, right, right. He lives there, too. Man. Richard Cousins is, of course, a, a fabulous bass player, long time yeah. member of the Robert Cray Band. Yeah. And, I mean, uh, working with Richard Cousins was just a joy because it's somebody I looked up to for practically most of my life. Yeah. You know, yeah. Robert Cray and Richard Cousins and the way they play together and everything's yeah. so writing with him. We wrote two songs, a soul ballad kind of, um, and then this No Place to Go song. And it was literally, he knew already what kind of groove I wanted. Yeah. He helped me finish to hash out the lyrics and <laughs> knew exact. It's like crazy, I, you know, to be able to just be that comfortable because, you know, I'm a baby at writing songs. So to have somebody like Richard to really kind of go, oh, man, just try and say it is, you know, not like telling me, oh, well, I, you know, I'm Richard Cousins, and you need to do it like this. Oh, just really conversational, you know, yeah. like we're talking right now. You know? Yeah. I don't know Richard, but I've seen him a lot, especially back yeah. when I first I started seeing Robert Cray probably in the mid-'80s. Oh, man, at the height. <laughs> yeah. And his, just his spirit was yeah. just to watch. He had just had this great, this yeah. great, this great energy. And uh, is, he yeah. like is he like that in person? Oh, absolutely. He's one yeah. of the most charismatic cats, you know, around. And also the other thing, I know you'll appreciate this too, Dave, is like, you know, all of these little guitar things we do, you know, like ending songs, like our favorite guitar players, like say Albert College, you know, the boom, da, da, you know, and all that. He knows all of those little, you yeah. know, guitar lingo things. And that's always, you know, yeah, that's cool. fun. Yeah. You know. Yeah, but yeah, it was, it's, it's yeah, and it's, it sounds like you're playing a strat on that. Um, yeah, I played the strat on the whole thing. Oh, uh, really? you know, I'll, I do that. I, I like, I always try, you know, with my own records, I try and approach them like one guitar on the whole oh, really? thing. Oh, really? Really? You know, just yeah. to be anti, you know, equipment and all that, just kind of just stick to one thing, like. All of our favorite guitar players, you know. It's true. It's true. Yeah. Yeah, you know, like to look at it like a Anson Funderburg record or Ronnie Earl or something, you know, yeah. like those cats, you know, just playing a strat, you know. You sound great on a strat, I gotta say, man. Cause oh, thank you so much. You know, I'm used to seeing you more as a Gibson guy, maybe a little more recently. Um, yeah, you know, I played. But Later. that sounds great too. You were, yeah, I think the last time I saw you live, you were playing a Les Paul. And yeah, you know, it's funny because I don't know about you, but like for me, like if a guitar sounds really good, you just kind of want to play it. I mean, I yeah, I'm home base is a strat, but I would say that if a guitar just does something or sounds a certain way, I'll just be like, oh man, for a little while, I got to just play this one or play. Yeah. LE or a 335, you know. So yeah. that's really it, just the sound, you know. Yeah, I got a yeah. story. I got a story you'll you'll appreciate from yeah. uh, from Space in Evanston. I'm one of the owners of the club. For those of you yeah. who know, and I, I get to see um, a pretty amazing variety of shows and musical <laughs> styles. Yeah. So um, we had Lucinda Williams booked. Oh, and, cool! Um, you know, when it was billed as a like a an intimate evening, so we were expecting, you know, I think a solo or duo show. And she yeah. showed up with a great guitar player from Nashville. And um, for the duo set, he had, I think, 17 or 18 guitars on stage for one set. Wow! And, and I'm a guitar geek. And I was yeah. like, you know, and he, it was all mostly like really cool vintage stuff. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, wow, what's that? Hey, what's that, man? What's that Fender? What's that Gibson? And it was just, it was, um, it was, was it Stuart Mathis or Stuart? Uh, Doug, Doug Pettibone. Doug Pettibone. Oh, Doug Pettibone. Yeah. yeah. Wow. 
Yeah, monster player. Yeah, you know, incredible, the, man. The fact that he had the crew and the yeah and the, uh, <laughs> the logistical means to do that was pretty cool, and he actually played them all. I think maybe yeah. Did he play yeah. pedal steel too? Uh, I think he might have. Yeah, there was yeah. a lot of gear on stage for a duel. But then the next Woo! night, the next night, Albert Lee shows up. Oh man, one guitar. <laughs> <laughs> one guitar, right? And that's all he Burn. Yeah. Yeah. So, I believe. Wow. Yeah, but I'm kind of the same way. I can get in a groove with like one jazz master or one Epiphone Riviera yeah. or one Strat, and I'll just stick with it. Yeah. But it's great to you hear know, you on a Strat again, man. It's, it's yeah, cool. you know, I just really just wanted to get back to, you know, like Kirk, like, you know, where when I first started playing blues in clubs, you know, which was like the late 90s. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I played a Strat, you know, before I fell under the spell of, like, Junior Watson and all those guys, I right. played a Strat. Yeah. You know, you know the, the influence of, like, Stevie Ray Vaughan, Jimmy Vaughan, Ronnie Earl, Anson Funderburg, Robert Cray, Duke Robillard a little bit, too, you know. I, I, I played a Strat, you know. And, yeah, I mean, it's home base. I played all my R&B and funk and gospel on that, too, so. Yeah. Talk about uh, what what kind of strats you've been playing. What kind of strat was on the record? Well, on <laughs> this is gonna be really retarded, I know. <laughs> but I have a 1964 strat and I have a 57 strat, right? Wow, fantastic guitar. Sing on every note, sustained sound. The 57 sounds like Anson and all of the stuff we love, right? Yeah. Okay, so. I left those guitars in Switzerland because I was like, oh man, a Strat. You know, I got Strats in LA, you know, at my friend's yeah. place and everything. So I get there, we put this Strat together and get it all ready and everything and it's not right. <laughs> and I'm like, no! <laughs> so I swapped pickups and got it refretted and done all this stuff to make it work, kinda. Yeah, with this body that I've had for years and just a parts caster, right? Okay. So I'm kicking myself. I'm like, man, I got all of the great strats in Switzerland and I don't have any of them for the whole record, you know. But Kirk, I do that kind of stuff. Kirk does that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and then my super reverb was blew up too. Oh, so I didn't man. have my super reverb that I've recorded with a million times. Oh, old strat. I'm like, no. So the record's a Blackface Deluxe and this part's caster. Oh, it worked. Hey. <laughs> sounded, sounded great, man. Sounds great. Well, thank uh, you so much. I yeah. appreciate it. And what, which studio did you record it at? Uh, a friend of mine, Alan, Alan Hertz, um, drummer, yeah. plays with um, a lot of guys, Scott Henderson and stuff. He's got a studio called Hertz Works. And Alan is a fantastic engineer, you know, so it was easy to talk to him and tell him what kind of sound I was looking for. Because on this record, I was really looking for like a, if you can marry, okay, the whole thing about the record is I was trying to marry Chicago blues, you know, Junior Wills, Buddy Guy kind of stuff with modern stuff, mm -hmm. you know, and record it in sort of a, more a little more modern way, you know, kind of recorded, kind of try and put Chicago blues right in there with like my original songs and kind of dress it up, shall we say? Yeah. Uh, maybe dress up is the wrong word, but you know, like try, yeah, just try and do Chicago thing and the kind of modern songwriting a little bit. I mean, mm -hmm. Ain't No Cure for the Downhearted is really only my take on like a phone booth. Uh, phone booth by Robert Cray. I mean, that's it's it's basically a minor blues. <laughs> it's just got yeah. this head on it, you know. But that's that's really, you know, the concept behind this record. Just kind of make it a little bit more modern sounding. Because I really, you know, I get so heavily involved in like these, you know, '60s and '50s and even four, late '40s records. And so, you know, and you kind of want that sound of the '60s and stuff and you know, I was like, man, but, you know, hey, you know, there were some cool records made in the 80s, too, you know, by some of the people that I love, you know, and I wanted to really 
shine a light on that on this right. record, you know. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's a, that's great because I think it's important for you know the blues you, being able to hear the roots and the foundation of it. But I personally, I, I want to hear something that sounds contemporary, that sounds like you know urgent and and doesn't you know there, I think the there's a tendency on the blues scene with a lot of guys trying to make records that sound like they were done in 1956 or something. And yeah, you know, that's kind of already been done guys, you know, well, really, you know, really well too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> really well. <laughs> yeah. It's like, do you really just want to try to, you know, I, I get it. I get it. I'm guilty. I've tried to do it. Oh yeah. Me too. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I, I applaud you for trying to take that more, you know, here and now contemporary approach. And it still, yeah. sounds, it still sounds like the blues and it still sounds like soul. And Well, thank I, you. I, I mean, I, I really, I really try to think about it like, hey, I'm going to just get all, the, try and get all the right elements, you know, together and play with all the feel like, you know, like this song I do by AC Recall, I'd rather fight than switch, you know, and I kind of do kind of like my Kirky buddy guy thing or whatever on that song, you know, and I really wanted to try and get some of that hoodoo man blues, yeah. you know, the uh, Leslie sound that Buddy's using on yeah. that record, you know, whatever it is. I've heard mixed things about what he actually used, but mm -hmm. maybe you know, but, you know, I want to kind of marry some of those things, you know. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, as far as I know, it was a Leslie. Yeah. You know, but... Killer sound. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Are you... Um, let's let's go a little deeper into gear. Because yeah. um, yeah. I, I know the pedals have changed, yeah. you know, the way guitar players approach playing. And I know, yeah. you know, of course, all of our heroes plug straight in. Yeah. <laughs> um, all of them, pretty much, you know. It made my life a lot easier when I was... Oh, man. Now. Yeah, and I still do it once in a while. But yeah. what? Uh, what do you have any any favorite pedals that you regularly use? Well, you know, basically, I use a pedal. I use pedals only to make things sound like how it would sound if you could play really loud, kind of. Oh. You know, some of my songs are modern enough to have to you need a little something more than just you know like what i would say like my blues sound like if i showed up to like a kim wilson gig or linwood slam or somebody like that i could just yeah. show up with reverb and an amp turned up right so my my music i need a little bit more but by modern standards that's still really really clean you know and yeah. i really I, I I have to say, I can't really play with a lot of gain. I, I'm really out of my comfort zone. Like if I have a backline amp or something and it's like too distorted or too overdriven, I'm really at a loss, you know, because yeah. I just can't manage it too well. Yeah. But I use pedals like I have this uh, collaboration pedal between Ibanez and this company from Japan called, well, the both from Japan, but Vimuram. And it's like a tube screamer, but it's really clear and it doesn't have this mid-range thing. Uh -huh. And I just use that to get the strength for it to sing. You know, it's not really distortion or overdrive. It just gets it to kind of yeah. hook. And uh -huh. that's about it. You know, and then reverb. I'm a real love reverb. Yes. You know. I mean, I you know, because you listen at those records of our favorite guitar players like B.B. King, or, you know, and it's like some of them are swimming in reverb, and I love that. Albert Collins, you know, I mean, that's... Yeah. that's Same here, amazing. man. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm a charter member of that club. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I even like to record with a lot of reverb because on this record, I didn't do it much because of the Strat, but... I like to record with even more reverb because a lot of people say it gets lost, but if you're only playing like a small band, I mean, what does it matter? You just want it, you know, you want to feel good, you know, so yeah. bring on the reverb. <laughs> and then other pedals, you know, like I have like a wah-wah pedal, old Vox wah-wah pedal, and I got a bunch of pedals and delays and stuff, but really, I'm really happy just 
plugging straight in or just maybe a little boost. If I don't have to, I won't even use any pedals. If it's got reverb sure. and amp and cook and yeah. yeah. How, how has it been um, adjusting to living in Europe? And hmm. um, I also know you mentioned that there are gigs happening there. Tell us about, first tell us about your adjustments to living in Europe. And then I'd love to hear about just how, you know, how the contrast is between life under COVID in Europe and life here. Yeah. Well, you know, um, moving here, actually, I played with this Italian pop artist maybe th four or five years ago named Eros Ramazzotti. So I lived in Italy for about a year off and on, you know. So that kind of really warmed me up to figure it out a little bit, uh -huh. you know. And then we toured so much, even starting back with, you know, like the T-Birds and the Manish Boys. And, man, we were going to Europe a lot. So I just started to kind of, you know, I wasn't coming in cold is what I'm getting at, you sure, know. Sure. But I had, so it was pretty, it was pretty easy to make the transition. And then my um, girlfriend, you know, made it easy, you know, and she's, obviously really helpful, you know, <laughs> making me make the transition. But yeah, I mean, I have a daughter in LA, so it does at times, you know, I mean, it's like, it's like you'll get this craving for like a taco <laughs> or a burrito, you know, you just, I mean, I live over 40 years in LA, so, you know, yeah, I mean, hard. I think it's the food and then just the, you know, like the language sometimes. Sure. But other than that, the way of life and the quality of life is really, really good. And that, you know, in regards to like what's going on now, uh, I would just say they just have it. People follow the rules better. Yes. So people just, if they say that if you need to do something, if you need to wear a mask, if you need to do this, if you need to stay locked down, then the people just do it. And then right. things go faster, you know, it just kind of snaps back a little faster, I think. And then, you know, you know, how the states are, it's kind of like, you know, each place is kind of different. It's kind of all over the place. Yeah. But it's still crazy here, too. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, this is, you know, it's it's crazy. You know, it's some countries that are going back into lockdown. It's some, you know, it's kind of all over the place here, too. But yeah. a little more civilized. Right. But there are there. Are there are there um, some festivals or some larger type gigs happening around you in Europe? Well, I don't know of any larger gigs. I think the cap, the maximum is like maybe 250, 300, something like that, you know. Okay. And, they're, and those are mostly in Italy and they're trying to, you know, Italy is a country that, you know, like, the arts and food and the enjoyment, that's a big part of their culture. So it's a different dynamic than, a, than the States. You know, the States was like, we were the first ones to be out of work and probably the last ones to go back in the States, you know? So yeah. other countries, they just view the arts and things in a different way. Yes. Know, I, guess sure. is, I guess, you know. And since you've lived there, have you found the have you found um, stronger opportunities and stronger respect being an American artist living as an expat? That's a wonderful question, but I do have to smile, Dave, because, I mean, when I played Space, I was like, oh, my God, this is a Monday, and, like, all of these beautiful people out there. So, you know, I just feel blessed, you know, like yeah. to be able to go and play you know, at a, you know, at space, you know, your club and, and have that kind of, you know, reception there. So, I mean, respect, I mean, I feel that it's, I feel, I mean, I hate to say it like this, but I do feel appreciated most places, you know, I feel like people, you know, appreciate what I do and I'm very humbled and happy and appreciative yeah. that they do. But, you know, it's like, I love European audience, but you know, I love my home too. Sure. You know, oh, that's yeah. what made me, you know, that's, yeah. that's where I learned playing in my father's church and like, 
the people, there's so many beautiful blues lovers and music lovers in the States too, you know. Yeah. Sometimes it doesn't get the short end of the stick, but I do understand that it's a special thing here. Like if you yeah. play in a club, it's an event. It's not going to be like 27 TVs on with the football exactly. game on, yeah, yeah. you know. And that I can dig. But I can also dig the cat that's coming out, <laughs> drinking a beer, <laughs> you know. Yeah, you know, yeah. I love that too, you know. It is something about that that thing about, you know, them knowing exactly what you're talking about right. too, you know. I hear so, you. I love it all. I just love anybody that loves music, cool. you know. Cool. Yeah. Let's, go, let's go back to, the, to your early days. Yeah. First of all, uh, you mentioned your father's church a couple of times. Where was yeah. that? That was in Compton, California, Macedonia yeah. Church of God in Christ. <laughs> all right. And you started out playing there, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> I started playing there when I was about maybe eight, nine years old, and my older brother played guitar. So, I, you know, I went to play guitar, too, you know? Yeah. And it's so weird because my older brother was into, like, a little mixture of everything, right? You know, like, he liked funk and all this stuff. And I liked all that stuff. I still love all that stuff. What am I talking about? But um, it's so strange. You know, I talk to my girlfriend and different people about this a lot. But, you know, they've, I always like blues. Mm -hmm. It's so, it's, it's like I always, even though I played R&B and all of this stuff, it's just something about, like, gospel, quartet music. When I heard, like, Howlin' Wolf and people like that, I could, I could really at an early age hear that kind of connection. It just moves yeah. me at an early age, you know? Yeah. Same here. Yeah. It just spoke yeah. to me and it was the most powerful music. I mean, my dad listened to Mahalia Jackson. And, oh, see, there you go. You know, <laughs> but That's still, when I heard yeah. Muddy Waters' voice, I was like, oh my yeah. God. It's like, what is that? Yeah. That I mean, it was the most powerful thing I'd ever heard. And, it, and it's crazy because there was like um, gangster rap, the West Coast rap scene, and there was all that stuff, Prince, and I love Prince and all these different artists. But, you know, I was thinking about this before, um, you know, this interview, and I was like, music to me is like food, right? You know, and I was spoon fed Southern food, you know, like fried chicken, mashed potatoes and gravy, greens, candy yams, all this stuff, right? And then, but I like other kinds of food too, you know, like Thai food and Mexican food and all that kind of stuff. And see, that's the difference. It's like blues is like that spoon fed ever since I was a baby kind of yeah. food. And I like all these other kinds of food too, but it's not yeah. quite the same as what you were fed when you were a child, you know? So that's really kind of how blues is I don't even think about it you know I don't even think like oh I'm listening to Joni Mitchell or I'm listening to country music or I'm listening to pop or slick west coast 70s music or whatever that's great I love it and I like slick music and all that but when it comes but blues is something it's almost like not even music it's just a way of life kind of you know like storytelling and the soul and everything and that's well, I'm good. talking about this. I don't know. No. <laughs> hey, man, I love that analogy. That's yeah, it's good. like food. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, talk about some of your first early blues gigs you know, around L.A. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. You know, I know I, I want to talk about your days with the Manish Boys and your days with the T-Birds. And Yeah. I know you backed up Linwood Slim quite a bit, but to talk about uh, some, of the, some of your first, your first club gigs. Well, my club gigs, I played first, like, let's, well, I played a lot of gospel music and a lot of, you know, like Holiday Inn type top 40 gigs and all that stuff for a few years, like quite a while. Okay. And then the first, like, legit kind of blues gigs <laughs> was with this uh, female blues guitar player, a friend of mine, Chris Wiley. And this goes back to, you know, like the mid 90s or something like that, really. And, um, yeah, playing in the club, learning my learning the ropes on that kind of blues. She was kind of more of coming from the kind of Stevie Ray Vaughan kind of thing a little bit, you know. And then um, a little while later, I was still playing kind of top 40, playing some blues, which I really wanted to play. 
And then it just started to one thing led to another. I started playing with people from my dad's church and we would do more top 40, but some blues, you know, and it yeah. just started to be more and more blues. And then I met Al Blake yeah. <laughs> from Hollywood Fast Man. And it was over after that. I mean, it was like full steam ahead, like Chicago blues, <laughs> country blues, West Coast blues. I met the man that really helped me, you know, with all of that, you know, like really knowing more about the history and knowing more about the records and all that. And then that led to other people like Kim Wilson and sure. obviously Slim, oh, Linwood right. Slim too. But, but the early gigs were like playing with whoever, whatever harmonica player I could find. Cause I really wanted to figure out this Chicago blues thing I more so than West Coast Jump, you know, I had to play a little bit of that, you know, to sure. play with the guys. But I really wanted to play, like, Little Walter stuff, backing up a heart, because I felt that this kind of encompassed so many different things, sort of like the swinging element, the Robert Jr., Robert Lockwood Jr., <laughs> and all of those different things in one, you know, yeah, sure. learning how to play rhythm and stuff. So that's really what I've done. And I played with, you know, James Harmon a little bit, mm -hmm. with Slim, Al Blake, Kim Wilson, Rod Piazza for a minute, and mm -hmm. James Cotton a little later for just a few gigs. But I'm really proud of that because he's my favorite. <laughs> yeah, a lot of harp players. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I, yeah, I was into it. I'm still – I love harmonica players. Yeah, you know? but it's interesting because the West Coast has been uh, such an important place for – Great harp players and great guitar yeah. players. But they're, yeah, know. even the Bay Area, too. Yeah, yeah with like right, Jerry right. Smith and all the guys, Mark Hummel. And, yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's cool. So, Kirk, you mentioned Al Blake earlier, and I just wanted our listeners and viewers to know Al Blake was, as you mentioned, the, the, the singer, lead singer in the Hollywood Fats band. For those of you who aren't familiar with Hollywood Fats, please check out uh, that that classic record that uh, yes, rock this house, yeah, so, yeah. That's that's kind of one of the definitive modern West Coast blues records. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Al Blake also played harp with that band, and he's still around. He, he's still he's yeah. still playing. He's still playing and, yeah, pops is still around. <laughs> yeah, cool. And and the Manish Boys. Tell us who the Manish Boys were and are. I don't know if they're still playing much, but I know your, your work with them is important in your career. Yeah, yeah the Managed Boys was basically like Randy Chorkoff was the guy who really uh, initiated that group. And it was basically supposed to be a blues review, sort of like a, a big blues review. And he done records and had a lot of guest artists on these records and sort of a house band with myself and Frank Goldwasser and and uh, Kid Ramos, the great Kid Ramos, you know. Um, and, yeah, this core band, Jimmy Bott was in there for a while. Um, well, he was um, – there was Richard in this, Jimmy Bott, and, uh, yeah, different guys. And it was just Bobby Jones, Finest Tasby. We had Johnny Dyer in there a little bit, and I'm probably leaving out a million more. But it was a big, you know, kind of blues review. So it was a lot of fun, and we made some uh, – Fun records. I had a lot of fun just in the studio, you know, getting to play a lot of blues guitar. And I was, I had been playing in that scene for a while, so it was sort of, you know, cool. And there's a little, little bit more uh, season, a little yeah. more gigs under my belt, I guess. Sure. Yeah. yeah that so was fun. Great. Yeah. Some of those records are so cool. And, uh, thank, love it. and thanks for mentioning Kid Ramos as well. He's one, oh. of, my, one of my favorites. And uh, I. You know, the uh, his record, Two Hands, One Heart, you know, I just found on Discogs, this uh, app on my phone, it's like a record marketplace, and you can just buy records from all over the world from your phone, sort of. So I found the Two Hands, One Heart, the original version of it on CD, and it's just like, man, hearing that record again after not hearing it for a while, man, tone impeccable. Linwood Slim sounds incredible on there. Janova Magnus is just a fantastic record. And Kid Ramos is one of the baddest. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And um, and let's talk about your work with the T-Birds. Um, yeah. Yeah. How did, you, how did you first get that gig? 
Well, you know, I played in Kim Wilson's solo band, you know, um, in the starting in the early 2000s, you know, and that was really, you know, that was really like my, you know, I really felt like that was really where I wanted to be, where I went to go, because Kim Wilson done like unadulterated, basically Chicago blues in the blues band. You know, and that's that was always my thing. I wanted to find somebody who played all night Chicago blues. <laughs> yeah. I should have just moved to Chicago, but yeah, I was gonna but, ask uh, you, you ever yeah. think about moving here? <laughs> <laughs> it's cold though. Nick Moss and everybody. I'm like, man. But uh yeah, so that was really sort of um, you know, the thing with that band. Then after that, I played with Charlie Musselwhite for a couple of years. Mm-hmm. And then Kim Wilson, I, um, I went on to join the Fabulous Thunderbirds um, after Charlie because, you know, I really, really love playing with Charlie Musselwhite a lot, you know, and I, you know, could have easily stayed there. But I just, you know, the T-Birds was a band that, you know, was sort of like a band. You know, and I'm in my early 20s, and I want to be in a band, especially when I had listened to for, you know, a lot of my life, you know, so yeah. when the position opened up and Kim called me, I took the position, you know, sure. I didn't want to leave Charlie because it was amazing and we're still friends to this day, but, you know, sure, sure. it was just about the band, the band thing, you know. And you were only in your early 20s when you joined the T-Birds? The, I was probably maybe 25 or something, like oh, 24. Yeah. Wow. 24, 25, yeah. That's impressive. You were pretty great when you were pretty young. <laughs> oh, man. Thanks. <laughs> it was a lot of fun, though, because, you know, my man, um, my dear friend, my little brother, Nick Kern, was in that um, band while I was in it, too. And, you know, it was really, it was really something, you know, especially when we first started because we recorded a record. You know, and just, I don't know, the whole experience was pretty, pretty amazing when you look back on it, you know. Yeah, which record? Playing with one of our heroes. Which, which, which record was that? Is that Painted On. We've done this record called Painted On. Yeah. All right. I'm going to have to Great. check that out. Yeah, I don't have yeah. that. Yeah. So speaking of records, yeah. throw, out, throw out a few of your Desert Island blues discs. Oh. I think well, I might have some handy. <laughs> uh, this record right here is one of my all-time favorite records of all, all time. Bobby Bland Dreamer record. Yeah. Now, this is like, you know, the West Coast kind of slick thing, you know, arranged and everything like that. But you got Bobby Bland singing on it. I yeah. mean, like, it doesn't matter who's playing, you know. Right. So this record, this combination, just a feel-good you know, Saturday night record. This is one of my favorites. All right. And this record, Chicken Shack. <laughs> this has got um, Luther, Snake Boy, Georgia Boy, <laughs> Johnson on a lot of it, and uh, Mojo Buford's on here. Sammy Lawhorn, Otis Span, you know, is on this record. And it's got uh, Mini Dress and uh, Please Remember Me on here with Luther Johnson singing on it, and it's amazing. Yeah. And then another record, kind of moving quickly here, <laughs> is a new acquisition that I found out about from my good friend Cadillac Zach. You know, he told me about this little Milton record, and it's got Magic Slam and the Teardrops on it, without Magic Slam, but the Teardrops are uh, playing, are the backing band on this record. So, you know, it's a little bit more... Little Moon has to play a little bit more guitar on it. And I just, I love it. All right. And, okay. Now, yeah, this record needs no <laughs> introduction. This record, when I think of blues, this is one of the records I think of. When you say, what, what does blues mean to you? I think that this Robert Nighthawk record is the tone and the singing on it. It's like just, it's just that really, that that vocal phrasing on there when he sings stuff like, got that way like a man, you know, the, that kind of stuff. I mean, it's, it's just amazing. Yeah. I mean, this record. And then this record, Johnny Shines and Robert Lockwood Jr. 
Oh, yeah. oh man, this has got like Pearly B on there and songs like that. The tone is insane. Cool. And then one more. One All more. right. Great, <laughs> great picks, Kurt. Great picks. Thanks. Oh, well, I lied. Two more. I'll, I'll be really quick, though. Johnny Young oh, with yeah. Jake Cotton playing harmonica on it. This yeah. is one of the most intense, fierce playing anywhere. And then... One of my all-time favorites, play your guitar, Mr. Hooker. Mm -hmm. Earl Hooker is one of my favorite guitar players of all time. And when I think of blues, I think of Earl Hooker a lot, you know. And I really owe a lot of my um, knowledge about Earl Hooker. Billy Flynn was a person that really hit me to a lot of the more inside, like, chordal stuff and little things. You know, Billy would just... Yeah, you know, show me little things. You know, he's just the encyclopedia. Yeah, he's, he's got that stuff down. down. He's got yeah, that yeah. down. It just those are great picks, Kurt. Just a step away from the blues. I remember, uh, yeah, when I mm -hmm. let, saw you, you yeah, had, you have a tune you wrote dedicated to Cornell Dupree. Oh, yeah. Why don't you talk up? Tell our tell our listeners and viewers for those of you who aren't hip to Cornell, his uh, his importance. A huge importance in the world of soul and R and B guitar. Well, Cornell Dupree didn't they call him Mister Five Thousand or something like he played on like yeah. five thousand records or something like that? Right. Cornell Dupree was from uh, Texas, a Texas guitar player, and you kind of marrying what I call like fat back rhythm and blues guitar. It's like a different thing. Like people say sometimes that he was like a funk guitar player or he was like all these different things. But to me, he's like part blues, part rhythm and blues, part soul guitar, beautiful chords, almost in that kind of almost Curtis Mayfield thing. Yeah. And you just kind of combine all of those things. Because, you know, when you play with people like King Curtis and you know, different people like Aretha Franklin he played with and Brooke Benton on Rainy Night in Georgia. Sure. You know, that's sort of encompassing a lot of different things, but the main thing is just the music feeling good. And Cornell Dupree was just one of the greatest guitar yeah. players. I mean, he just made everything better. Musicians like Billy Preston, yeah. Cornell Dupree, Eric Gale, you know, Bernard Purdy, James sure. Gatlin, they just make the music feel good. And that's all I've ever tried to do, you know, just try and follow in those guys' footsteps. Yeah, that's a, that, that's a great philosophy and great inspiration, too. Thanks, Kurt. Thanks so much for doing this. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. Yeah, stay safe and healthy. And the new record, again, My Blues Pathway, drops on September 25th. And Absolutely. Cor correct me if I'm wrong, KurtFletcher.com. For, uh, um, Kirk Fletcher Band .com. Kirk Fletcher Band .com. Band .com is the website, <laughs> and so it's a cool website. And I know the uh, the new video for Ain't No Cure for the Downhearted is now up on YouTube. I think just like as of yesterday or today. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. check out the video and um, look forward to hearing you live again, Kirk. All right. Same here, Dave. Hopefully we can play something together. <laughs> yeah, I would love to, man. Thank you. And I still have your sweatshirt. <laughs> All right. I got to get that sweatshirt. <laughs> yeah. All, All right. right. Thank you so much. Thank you again, Appreciate man. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.